the date question report. If you haven't gotten it, please apply us after class, and we'll hand it back to you. Um, um, so let's see what's coming up. The, the, the clustering homework is due, is due in a week. Um, so if you, if you have questions on that, um, you should make sure to try and um, look at it over the weekend or the next couple days. And then um, Yana's office hours Monday morning. Um, so, she, um, so she can help you with that. Um, so hopefully there will be less kind of uh, tricky aspects of the coding to worry about um, with, uh, with this assignment. So um, hopefully there aren't as many questions, but I um, still suggest you look at it um, ahead of time in case something comes up. Um, and then, um, the, the, uh, so, so, I, so I'm handed back um, the, the response of the data collection report. Um, so, so the uh, um, it seems most people are doing well on that. that, that um, they've gathered data, or it's it's almost here in some extent. Um, the next thing to do for the project is is the intermediate report. So this will be due the first Monday after spring break. Um, so. Um, I apologize that you know the first thing after spring break. I realize that, that can be kind of a pain sometimes, uh, but I'm not asking for you to have a finished product, right? I'm asking for you to make some progress towards the goal. Um, and it's two weeks from now, so hopefully you time to get um, some stuff working. And so then, um, so hopefully you have some direction. You've tried out some techniques at that point, and I'll talk a little bit more what I'm being asking for on next Monday. Um, but the, the point of this is that you can tell me your progress and then I can give you some feedback on what direction you should go next. Right? So if you're still wondering exactly what you should do, well, it's, it's, so I can kind of tell you now, but I kind of want you to explore the data and try some techniques. And then at the point of, of, of the intermediate report, I can give you some more specific feedback. But also, hopefully, you're, you're pretty far along at this point um, so that um, it, when you're working on the final report, you don't have to scrounge at the last minute to try and be running these experiments. You can more focus on the presentation of it. Um, so I'll have to read through them all and carefully. And so the more time you spend on the presentation, the more happy I'm going to be about it. The more happy I am about it, the better you're going to probably do on it. If I have to kind of read through it and kind of figure out what you're trying to say, then you know I'm. I'm not going to be as happy about. So I, I want to give you some time to actually spend on the presentation of that, um, not just on getting something to work. Because um, when you're actually working with with, uh, with real data, if you're working at a company, or even if you're in, in grad school, you have to write some paper and you have to do it clearly so people can understand what you're talking about. So don't just push, put this off to the last minute. Actually spend a little bit of time making sure that you've explained things and you've explained them. Um, in a way that's clear. Um, okay. Um, so, um, to, so on Monday we talked about finding frequent items, and we specifically looked at streams um, on finding frequent items and streams. Um, what we're going to do today is talking about finding um, frequent item sets. Um, <coughs> Sets. Um, so this will be, you know, slightly more complicated than finding frequent items, and I'll specify this a bit more clearly. Um, this in a second, and we also aren't going to run this um, directly on streams, but still the idea of using a streaming type algorithm is going to be very helpful in this regard. Um, so, so it's going to kind of build on two of the things that we talked about on Monday. So. Um, the problem here is that in, uh, we're again given these, uh, these, uh, um, we have these large, uh, um, um, we have these uh, uh, large sets of things um, coming in, think of them as T1, T2, T, T3, and these are like tuples of items. So instead of having one item each time, each of these is going to be a set. 
right? So this could be um, the set one, two, you know, three, something like this. So this contains three items. And we're, we have a whole bunch of these items. And um, the, 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 so we can think of this problem as, um, so, so let's see, we have this um, script T, which is going to be the set of tuples um, up to Tm. And each Ti is going to be a subset of some universe of items of, um, of size n. And so n is going to be something that's large. And so, you know, of course, it's not actually going to be numbers. These are going to be things that we somehow need to, we're going to think of representing them as, as some sort of number that can identify them. And this will kind of abstract the way we can think about these. So you can, you can think of these items coming from some universe. So one example of this is that this is data from a grocery store. And it, this is the most kind of, um, the most, um, um, the most famous example, but these are items from a grocery store, and every person who checks out, you know, has th these items that they buy as a group, right? So I, um, so this could be actually they have, you know, bread, um, milk, and diapers, right? So um, probably if you have kids, then this is maybe a very common thing that you would get at the store, right? Um, so. And so everyone, every customer who comes through is going to have a, uh, um, is going to have a different set of items, and the goal is to find, you know, if you buy two items, say if you buy two items, what's a common third item you would probably also buy? And so this is used. So if you if you go to the grocery store and and you buy some items, and then this they uh, when they print out your receipt, they also print out this on this coupon. Right, they'll print out this coupon of um, for some other item that they um, they think you would also like to buy. Right, so um, how do they make this prediction of this other thing you would you would possibly also like to buy? And a part of this is by saying, well, people in the past have bought bread and milk, um, or if, or maybe also they brought um, diapers and bread. Then they probably there's a good chance you want to buy milk. And if you have too much milk in stock right now, then you would say, well, let's give them a coupon for milk and see if we can get them to go back and buy some milk also. Um, so these are the sorts of things. Um, but this could also be much larger in scale. So instead of you know just all the items in a grocery store, maybe a grocery store has, I don't know, maybe 10,000 items that they sell. Uh, maybe, maybe it's larger than 10,000, right? But, um, you could also think of this as if you're monitoring um, packets on a network, there are certain features that these packets might have that they might trigger so, uh, um, some sort of alarm. And so um, if, they tr if they trigger certain types of alarms together, then this may point to it being some sort, of, um, some sort of virus or something like that. But if they each trigger just you know one alarm by itself, um, then it might not be that case. And it, it could be that um, that um, these sets are like um, alarm one, um, alarm two, and uh, virus A. Right. So th this packet that comes in, it triggers this first alarm. It triggers the second alarm. And these are things we can calculate quickly as they come through. And then in order to figure out this, we have to run a more expensive test, right? But we only want to run this test if it triggers the first two alarms. Um, but we want to figure out if when you have this virus type, you also commonly fig you know, figure out these, these first two alarms. We want to see what are the things that co-occur together. And then we can say, let's test for the fast things, and then when we think it might be the, the thing that's more expensive to test, then in that case we can go and do this. And we don't have to be completely accurate. We can kind of guess on these things. This isn't like a hard and fast rule, um, but it's some sort of kind of, um, uh, it's, it's, it, 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 it's some sort of guide that we're using to try and find things quickly. 
Um, and because you know these viruses are maybe mutating or, or changing over time, you know this this is not always accurate. But it, we can try and we'll try and update this over time. Um, um, okay, so um, so this this class of problems is actually known as um, association rule mining. Um, and so the particular way we're going to try and attack this and, and discuss this today is by finding these frequent item sets. So you're going to have these large set of these tuples. And each of the tuples is going to have a subset of items, not just one item, but this is a subset um, from this domain. And we want to find the, 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 and the goal um, 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 the goal is to find um, these um, subsets of, of n which um, are large and um, and that occur in many um, tuples, right? So so if this subset is going to be interesting, if it's if it's going to occur in many of these things, so in, in many of these uh, these different tuples. And it's easy to find maybe some things that are only a size one. Maybe there's there's one alarm that goes off for most things, but it you know it's it's going to have a lot of um, false positives. So this this one alarm by itself is not that interesting because it's it's a small set. So we want to find sets as large as possible that also occur in many of these tuples. And so what we're going to do is we're specifically going to set a threshold here. Um, so, um, so for this one, we're going to say um, more than an epsilon um, um, fraction of tuples. So we're going to set some parameter epsilon. And epsilon might be like 1%, um, like something like that, in a large data set. So it occurs in more than epsilon fraction of the tuples. And then we want to find them as large as possible that satisfy this property. Okay, so let's say, so, this, so we'll only set this one parameter epsilon, and then we're going to try and find these sets. And I'll explain more as I go through some examples in the algorithm, the other properties that, that we want these sets to have. We don't just want any set, but sets that kind of are, in some sense, maximal. Um, and so, um, so, this, um, so just to illustrate this, um, let's say by large we have some parameter k. And we have n possible items, and we want a set of size k. So let's say n is going to be like 10,000, right? all the items in the grocery store. And k is going to be uh, um, like 3, right? So, so the question, how many sets of size three? Right. So, how many sets do we possibly have to consider of size three? Right. So, so, so people have taken any combinatorics or. Uh, so this is n choose three, right? So n choose three, and this is approximately n to the third. Right, so if it's n is going to be 10,000 to the third, uh, so for n equals 10,000, then this is going to be approximately um, 10 uh, to the power uh, 12. Right, so this is this is a really large number of sets of size three that we want to consider. So it's 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 less a little bit less than this. This is an overestimate, but it's about on the right order. This is too many sets that we will actually want to try and count and look at these individually. Um, and so, and this is only sets of size three. If we look at sets of size four, uh, which might be even more interesting, this is going to be an even harder problem, right? This is growing. This problem is growing exponentially harder as you um, as you increase 
uh, as you increase the size of the set. Yeah. How would we? How are we going to deal with the problem that if we're looking at that many possible sets, that there's a chance that we're going to get some just random co-occurrence that we think are going to be really strong relationships? Well, that's possible. So you know, if it if you have some uh, um, some co-occurrence that occurs in one percent of all sets, right? Then then it's it's it it, it means something. People t um, people tend to buy these together, right? So that there's this. Very famous example when the algorithm I'm going to talk about first came out. I think one of the examples they looked at data from a grocery store and they found that people tend to buy uh, um, beer and diapers uh, together at the same time, right? And this is this, that makes so, sense clearly. Yeah, um, so stress. you know, at, at first you know this doesn't make any sense at all. But then they thought, well, you know, it's it's the fathers running out to get. Uh, um, um, I'm out to get the diapers, and while he's out, you know, he's probably sent out by his wife. But then he, then the father says, "I'm going to get some beer also while I'm out," or something like that, mm -hmm. right? And so this this happened a lot more than they expected, and they thought, okay, this is just random noise, but maybe it's not random noise. If it actually co-occurs that often, then there is evidence that maybe it is interesting. No, no. Well, I mean, I agree, but like, so what if I have a data set and I and I don't know if there's any real core occurrence? What if I've generated a random data set? If I analyze it with this, I'll probably find some patterns that even though they were just, you know, random, they weren't intentional. Yeah, so that's a good question, actually. So what you'd want to do then is probably some sort of statistical technique like a power test. Uh, have you heard of this? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, so, so a power test is when you say um, um, under some. So, well, there's there's other kind of names for the subclass of these that I'm blanking on. I imagine something but like given if it was all random. What? Not hypothesis. And then, yeah, so yeah, right. and then not hypothesis, you have some distribution. So you you have a threshold to reject that they are not hypothesis. So given this rule. And if the alternative hypothesis is true, then the power is uh, the chance you, when the alternative hypothesis is true, you reject the null hypothesis. Right, right. So um, the basic idea is you, you have some model that you generate, you can try generating these random sets from under some model you think describes what a random set would look like. And then you run your algorithm on these, uh, on these, um, uh, on these, um, on these random sets, and, and you, you see how large sets, you yeah. find these correlations. These correlations were there just by noise, right? Mm -hmm. So you expect to find, there's always some largest set that has some fraction, right? And if you find, it, so you expect to see a certain number, and this tells you under this noise model how large the set under this epsilon value you expect to see for this value n. And then you compare what you actually found versus this, and this tells you on what fraction of, say, on what fraction of the random data did I find a set this large with this value epsilon, and this tells you kind of, in some sense, how likely it is to be from random noise versus something not from random noise. And the, 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 this is one way of trying to kind of check versus the random noise. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. So. Um, so we have all these sets that we're um, that we're considering here, and um, how do we find the ones which um, are going to be occurring very frequently, right? And these large sets which are going to be occurring very frequently. Um, so um, the key insight in this problem was that. When they were looking at this, they realized that if there's some set, um, so say there's some set, let's um, let's say these elements are say 7, 16, and 2, right? If if this set occurs in um, say 5% um, of all um, tuples, right? So, this, so let's say 5% of all people coming into a store end up buying milk, eggs, and um, cheese or something. I don't know, right? So, so everyone, so 5% of all people buy milk, eggs, and cheese all together, right? Then what that says is that at least 5% at least of people on every 
time to the store must um, must individually buy um, uh, must individually buy just milk, right? So this milk must be a very common item that is bought by a lot of people. So if so, in order for this set to occur in five percent of all things, all the individual items must occur in at least five percent of things as well. Um, so, so then we can use this idea to really prune down the search that we want, right? So, um, so, so, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, in the first pass, um, find all individual, um, so, the, the, um, so the items in this universe um, that, um, that occur at least epsilon fraction of the time. Right? And, and so what's going to happen is that this set that we find is going to be a much smaller than, than, than everything we have to worry about. Right? Um, so th then we only need to consider, uh, say, if we want to find triples, only triples th that occur from this uh, um, set of items. So let's say that this set, the output of this is going to be n1, which is going to be much, much smaller than n. Right? So this is our full set, and this n1 is much smaller. Right? So so if we want to find triples, right, then we still have n1 choose 3, which is approximately n1 cubed of these triples we have to look at. Right? So if we want to find triples, we, we've, we've narrowed it down, but this is now, the n1 is much smaller than n, so we've, we've saved a lot of things we have to check. Um, so but we don't have to go directly to these triples, we can first say, um, Instead of going to triples, we can first look and see, well, which, if I have a triple that occurs 5% of the time, then each of these pairs individually must also occur 5%. Right? So instead of going to these triples, we then have, a, have another round of the algorithm. So, um, so find all pairs in, um, um, Say um, I J, uh, which is in. Um, I don't have a great. Um, let's say two to the n one. This is not really great notation for this, but this is the set of all items which survive the first round, right? So you have all pairs here, um, uh, which occur. Um, um, was an epsilon fraction. Um, and then after we have all these pairs, this is going to print down uh, much further um, th than just these single terms, because most things that, that are bought aren't actually um, aren't actually bought together. And so this will print down even more, and then eventually, and then you can look at triples, which are made up of only which all um, all of the, uh, the the pairs all the pairs in the subset of those triples each occurred um, themselves at least an epsilon fraction of time. I keep repeating this until there aren't any sets left. Um, and so this is something, so it's kind of pruning the search down in a way that's very intelligent. Um, and so what's, what's, what's better than this is that each of these steps you can actually do very quickly. Um, so you can do these all by reading over this large set of tuples once. So you're going to make one pass on the data here, and then make another pass on the data here. And then if you need to make um, up to size, sets of size k, you only need to make k passes while reading over all of these tuples. Right? So if these are all the receipts um, that pass through the grocery store in the last you know, six months, this is a huge number. You don't want to, you're not going to spit this in the memory of your computer. Maybe it's on the hard drive, so you only want to access it from the hard drive a small number of times. And, and, uh, the, and this will allow, each of these phases will be very fast in terms of how it accesses the hard drive. It won't be random access. So by using this idea of streaming the data through as you process it, this multi-pass idea, you're going to have very efficient algorithms um, 
you know, even in, in a sense different from the big O notation, even in, you know, actually implementing it well on, 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 on a given system. Um, so, okay, so let me go through an example here, um, just to make this more concrete. And so, um, so when you talk about um, the size of data, you know, there's the size of data that fits in memory, the size of data that fits on your hard drive. Well, when coming up with this example, I realized there's, a, there's another interesting size of data. Um, those that you can effectively run on the, on the, on the you can effectively run on the whiteboard during class. Um, so I made some a larger example in the notes um, in the in the notes in the in the nice document. But I realized going through that in class is going to be way too long. Um, so right before class, I made a smaller one, which I think fits in the size of a size of a whiteboard. Or not just fits in there, but you're not going to get so bored with me just writing stuff up here. Um, so, so we're going to have these five tuples here. Um, So, so, so n in this case, let's see, so n is going to be 7, so the set of, of things that might count as 7, and let's set as a threshold, let's set epsilon equals to 0.4, which is equal to 2 out of 5, right? So I need at least two instances of everything to survive. And so if I were to, so I'm going to look for sets of size 3, right? If I have 7 things, then um, 7 choose 3, is going to be equal to 35. So I don't want to keep track of 35 different sets as I'm going through here. I want to do something where each time I go through is going to be smaller than this. Um, and so, so even with this example, you'll see that the number of sets I need to keep track of is going to be, you know, at least on the blackboard scale, much smaller than 35. Okay. So. In the, in the first round here, I'm going to have these um, these seven counters, and so I'll go through and count how many how many ones I have. It's going to be three. How many twos? This is four. How many threes? There's only going to be one. How many fours? Only one four. Uh, only one. Five. There are five sixes. Okay. Uh, let's see if I have that. This example will probably work even if it's different from the notes. Okay. And I have two setups. Okay. So so what this means is that um, if I'm looking for sets that have at least 40 occur about at least 40 percent of the time. Then anything with three, four, and five is out, right? So, so I can, so I only need to consider um, these guys anymore. Three, four, and five are no longer important. Okay. So then, um, so, then it's, so then I need to look at all sets of size two. Um, so one plus two, one plus six, one plus seven, two plus six. 2 plus 7, right, uh, and, and 6 plus 7, right? So now I only have um, only have 6 sets here. Um, but if I had done 7 choose 2, I think I would have had 21 sets here to look at. Right, so now I'll, I'll look at these sets. 1 and 2 occur together twice. 1 and 6 occur together three times. 1 and 7 occur together twice. 2 and 6 occur together four times. 2 and 7 uh, <coughs> once. And 6 and 7 twice. Okay, so now I can prune um, I, I can prune 2 and 7. So I now have these sets left. 
Okay, so I, I've only pruned, uh, um, I've only pruned one set here, but if I look at the set of triples, this actually brings down the set of triples a fair bit. Um, if this example works, okay. So one, uh, so I have one plus two plus uh, six. I have one plus, not two plus seven, because two and seven didn't occur enough together. Uh, so one plus six plus seven, and then I have two plus six, and not two plus seven, so I don't make anything with two, uh, and, and then that's it, right? So I only have these that remained, even though I only proved one of these sets here. Okay. Um, and so now I'll look, one plus, two plus six occurs twice. And one plus, one plus six plus seven, one, two, and this also occurs twice. Okay, so these are both good. Can I get any sets of size, any sets of size four? Right. It would have to be one plus two plus six plus seven, and I, this had already been proved. Right, so, so in order to get a set of size four, I would have to have at least four of these, right? Because um, you can leave out each one of them once. Um, right, so, so I found these, so I've, um, so I found these sets here, right? So, so these are sets of size three, which, is, uh, um, which have occurred twice, and so maybe you would say, um, so I have, I've, uh, if, you know, if, uh, if, 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 if these are, um, so um, one and six occur in both of them, um, but so if I say I have one and two, then maybe I would recommend six. Or I have one and seven, I would recommend six, something like that. Um, so these are, you know, these association rules you can build on these things. So it's a pretty simple technique, but this works for finding these, these patterns in, in, in these item sets. Um, and the algorithm is it's not very complicated. So this is basically known as the A priori um, algorithm. I'm not exactly sure why they called it exactly that, but, um, and this is by let's see, um, Agarwal, Agarwal and Shrikant. And uh, it was Um, right, so, um, so what sets, what patterns do we want to return out of all this mess? So, we, so if you have more complicated examples, you'll see that some, some sets terminate when you get to the size of four or, or eight, and maybe other sets only terminate when you get to size two. Are some of these sets of size two interesting? So that there's, some of these may still be interesting. So we'll look at what you say as a, as a maximal um, set. And so this is a set that that um, um, that th there are no larger sets which contain this. So no larger sets. Um, Um, so, so, so any set that you get at the bottom layer um, has to be a maximal set, right? Um, but you could also see that, um, I guess in this example, let's see, are, are, there, are there any other maximal sets here? So, so by maximal set, um, no other larger sets with, you know, an epsilon frame of, of data, right? So only sets I've, I've uh, circled in blue here.
Yes? No? No. No. No, okay. But, um, that's, um, that's right. So uh, I think an example I've got, one of the other examples I'll have in the notes has, has other steps which are maximum. But it, um, um, for instance, if I have two instances of, of three, um, well, so, so I think I've got an example in one of the notes that I had two instances of three, but there were no sets of size two that had um, an epsilon fraction of the three, because both of those instances were split with, with, other, with other items that didn't um, have any co-occurrences together. Uh, I just wondering, that, am I right or not? The original version of this algorithm is based on a tree. That in the first phase, they construct the tree, and this, in the second phase, actually, it forms the item set. Or so there, 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 are, there, there are other ways of, of thinking about this where you can draw this dependency graph on, on all of the sets. Right? You have this lattice on all the possible sets. And you can then you can see this, this maximal structure in this lattice um, kind of more clearly. Um, if you look in, in the book on this, it draws some, some nice pictures of this, but um, I'm not gonna try and do it. it take me all day to draw them on the board. So um, uh, for instance, if, uh, so, so, so I can draw it just with um, just with two items, or or with with only three items, and you have sets one plus two, uh, one plus three, two plus three, and then let's see, one plus two plus three. These are the only sets you have, and you see that these two are um, these two sets have one as a subset. These two have two as a subset, and these two have three as a subset, and all of these have. Um, no, I didn't mean that. That's right. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I knew this algorithm. I actually I think that I knew this algorithm. Okay. That it works. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. So the, it's a, there are other versions and variations on, on this algorithm. Um, so that you know, if you just scan them this way, this this works very efficiently at at um, really large scale. Um, so that there may have been another version I'm not aware of that used some tree structure, but I'm not sure. Um, um, so all right, so um, so the, so, the, um, so this algorithm.